<laughs> okay. It's about that time. Welcome to thermodynamics. Um, I think, actually, I'll start today talking a little bit about the lab. <coughs> And in particular, um, let me let me change. This is what we have to do. And we change it over. There we go. We're going to be doing a lot of more of this coming up with the next chapter, so this is a good time to talk about interpolation. Um, in the chart that we had, you know, they, they tell us, oh, an atmospheric pressure and boiling temperature is 100 degrees C. Well, inside this building, it might have a negative pressure relative to outside, or it might have positive pressure. And, um, but at any rate, we weren't 101, we were like 5% lower uh, atmospheric pressure in the room. So the boiling pressure, if you, if you didn't get 100 degrees C, it was really close. But you should have been, um, you know, the question is, what, based on the, the atmospheric pressure, what was the boiling temperature that you would have hoped to see your uh, um, thermocouple reading? So, you know, basically that, that the temperature lab, you could put a thing in some water, it gives you a number. There are data tables, they'll give you a number. This would be for pure water, meaning like, you know, distilled water. And we didn't have distilled water, but if you put salt in water or sugar in water, does that change boiling temperature, freezing temperature, and all that? So if there was, if that water wasn't pure, that's going to also be a factor. I doubt that it's much of a factor for what we're doing. Uh, but in the table that was in your uh, second page of your lab write-up, there was this, you know, 98 degrees. Somebody figured out it's 94.4 kilopascals, and if it's 99 degrees, it's 97.9 kilopascals. But we have something around 95, which is between those two. So we know it's between these two. But exactly what is the temperature that we can predict? Now, in tables, if you have two data points, you know, it's all it's usually a curve of some sort, but even if it's a really radical curve, if you're two points close enough together, even the, the wiggliest curve will look like a straight line. It might bow out a little bit, but um, Probably, if, if your data points are closer, close enough together, it always looks like a straight line. So we can use linear interpolation. And basically, the way I think of it, an interpolation means in between the points. So based on this data, what does it look like graphically on that curve? We don't, didn't see the rest of the curve. We just saw a table. But the table is defining the curve, or a line. And if you think about it, between this point and that point, here is temp saturation temperature. We want to know here's the pressure that we have the data for. And at this pressure, or at this, yeah, at this pressure, it's that temperature. At this pressure, it's that temperature. That's what we know. And we know we're in between. Um, can we use a proportionary triangle since they use the same angles? That's, I was, it's, here's, can't we use a proportional? Yeah, that was actually my very next point. Thank you very much. This is like Professor Berman like me in the morning. I'm awake. <laughs> Isn't this triangle the same shape as that triangle? So if this is 40% of that, then this would be 40% of that. So, but it isn't 40%. So 
So the way the interpolation thing works is here P2, the point in the middle, the one you want to know minus the low over the high minus the low equals the temperature you want to know over the low. This distance, this proportion, this is a proportionality, this is the same proportion. We're basically saying that the horizontal proportion is the same as the vertical proportion. So what you want to know minus the low over high minus low, what you want to know over low over high minus low. If you solve that for <clears throat> what you want to know, how do you do that? Well, you multiply both sides by, here's that, basically here's that, the total temperature distance, and here's the proportion. And then if this is multiplied over here, and then you add this to both sides, you've isolated that guy, and that's all we're doing. Take that low temperature plus the proportion of the one in between, uh, of the, the, the distance between the two, and you will get it was 98 plus 1 degree C times the proportion, which turns out must have been about 30%. So, so that comes out to whatever you have in practice, that comes out to be pretty, pretty small? This was 0.3. It's going to be less than <laughs> 1. Because if it was more than one, then you better go back and look at things because it's going between two things. It can't be bigger than, than the thing it's between. So this is always going to be some percentage or, you know, <coughs> point something. And there's probably point two eight nine six five four. I don't know. We don't really know more than one digit on this. So based on that, it says that uh, your thermocouples, if they're reading correctly, if our pressure was reading, again, there's an error. I don't know what the error was in the pressure reading, but you know, 98.3 degrees C is probably what I would expect if the pressure was precise and calibrated and good. Now, it doesn't mean if you got different numbers that you're wrong. It just means you're you're seeing the error, how uncertain are you know, if you're coming at it from different angles and and you know you're hitting different numbers, you're going to be in the ballpark. But, but that, that's, um, that's how you find from the table uh, and a value that's between two points, interpolating. If you do that, I was going to add the two and the <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, you, if you can, <laughs> and it comes down to a metric. If, if you remember this, and it'll always, it'll be for other things. We'll be using this for enthalpy, we'll use it for... Pressures we use it for specific volume. It's our, we're gonna. That's the next chapter. Is all the different ways how fun we can use this concept. But anytime you have a table and you're between the two points, you end up with something like this going on. Now your book actually has. When time comes to do the test, you probably have to do some of this. Uh, in homework wise, there's probably look up. Basically, there's um, in in the real world. There's probably uh, you know spreadsheets and things that you put in a temperature and a pressure or whatever, and it comes out with all that stuff. It just uses the formulas that the tables are built from, and and calculates it directly. But uh, for the tables we're using, this is how you find when they're in between two. And if you get really good at it, uh, familiar with it, and confident with it. If I was looking at this, it'd say 94.4 to 95.5, that's 11. Uh, you know, 55 to 44, that's 11 out of uh, 44 to 78. 11 out of um, or 79, that's 44 minus 79. 35. So 11 out of 35 is about 0.3. So you can you can kind of estimate these things too. It just whatever this proportion was is that, and then I knew that that was one degree. So if I get this percentage, then I could just say, oh, it's the bottom value plus that percentage of difference. You can actually estimate it fairly, fairly quickly, but this is the mathematical way to, to get the numbers. Yeah. Do you see that the linear value is what you're Yes. Yeah. This, this is, this, this is, this is, um, you know, this is, that's M. 
and that's uh, x, is that right? No, that's m, that's the slope, that's your x plus c. But this really, this is the proportion of the change in temperature over change in pressure. So this, these two together are the slope, this is your x. Change the, the distance you went, and it's, it's the mx plus b is really what it comes down to. Uh, hard to see that sometimes. Okay. So last time we did that. We found the system efficiency and the turbine efficiency. Um, and now we have a couple slides talking about environmental effects before we actually talk about um, the whole start getting into properties, thermodynamic properties. Um, when you burn a fuel, uh, your hydrocarbons turn into the hydrogen becomes oxygen combines, releases energy, and it comes out as water vapor, generally. Water, as usually as, as essentially steam, because it's hot enough. Um, and CO2, the carbon, oxygen attaches to it. And really what happens is the fuel molecule breaks apart, and it has relatively loose bonds, maybe, is a way to think of it. And it, it comes apart relatively easily. And then the it finds the oxygen, and when it comes to oxygen, it like smacks together with the oxygen, and it shakes. And that's the thing we call temperature. So it's like you kind of go boom. And there's a net gain by how hard it, it forms with the oxygen. It's hard to, to carve the oxygen again. You can't use the oxygen. The CO2, like a fuel, because it's more tightly bound. I like, that's the way I think of it anyways. So you take sort of loose, the, the relatively easy to make the, molecule, the fuel molecule come apart. When it combines with oxygen, bam, it comes together and it shakes and shakes this temperature. And suddenly, the temperature of your air fuel mixture becomes a really high temperature uh, CO2, H2O mixture. Air is not mostly oxygen. Air is mostly nitrogen. So if you're going to burn a fuel, yeah, you get the oxygen, but you get all the in-laws that come with it, which is, you know, the, so the nitrogen comes along for the ride. The nitrogen is, is pretty non-reactive. Oxygen is pretty reactive. Oxy nitrogen less so, such that as long as you keep the combustion temperature low enough, the nitrogen stays stuck together, the N2. Um, so in reality, what you get is some hydrocarbon, propane, uh, uh, natural gas is primarily methane. It's not pure methane. There's also ethane. And, but methane is one carbon, and carbon holds on to four other things. So one carbon, four hydrogen. It's the simplest organic molecule. Propane is C3H8. And uh, octane is eight carbons. And diesel is rated for 16 carbons. But when you get into gasoline and, and refined um, <clears throat> Petroleum that starts to become a soup. They just they just boil off. They, they just condense things at various temperatures, fractionate. They take the crude oil, boil it up, and they end up with tar at the bottom and uh, lighter gases at the top. Um, so other stuff happens. Uh, Nox is the big. Thing. That's actually, I'm told that like the brown stuff in the pollution sometimes, that, that if you make a NOx in a lab, it comes out sort of this brown gas. I haven't seen it done, I was told that. But um, that's what happens if your temperature gets too high and some of the nitrogen molecule breaks apart. And when the nitrogen breaks apart, when it comes together, it goes to the oxygen because the oxygen is really reactive. And you can get NO 
NO2 and NO3. So since you don't know if you got one O or two O's or three O's, or I don't know if there's four O's or ten O's, or whatever. They just call it NOx, anything that's a nitrous oxide. Which, by the way, anyone ever use like the laughing gas at the dentist? That's NOx. That's why I think it's NO2, maybe NO. I'm not sure which NO it is, but nitrous oxide is laughing gas. Uh, not as much fun when it's, you know, just pollution in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And it's fairly stable, so it really doesn't go away particularly fast for some reason. Um, so um, if this starts sucking up the oxygen, and you had enough oxygen for your fuel, and now suddenly it's grabbing oxygen, uh, it might happen that there isn't enough oxygen for the CO2 to be formed. So you may end up with CO, carbon monoxide, <coughs> which is a poisonous gas. It's also a fuel. It's it's incomplete. You could burn it. You can it'll it will if you, all you had was carbon monoxide and you add oxygen and heat, it will turn into CO2 and give you some more heat. It's not the best fuel, but it, it is incomplete combustion. That that's the theory of how like an EGR valve works, right? It's set in the unburned exhaust field back of the cylinder to try and reburn to get better emissions. It does, but not about the CO. But I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, ozone hatches, I'm not sure about that. There's also uh, what they call HC, They're basically unburned fuel. You can have you know, an octane and end up with maybe methane comes out of the you know, unburned fuel, <coughs> incompletely combusted fuel. That's another major uh, pollutant. And I used to love to chase my father's uh, Studebaker up the hill when he was taking off in the morning when I was like in kindergarten because you could smell the gasoline. He had that, that smell and it was a hot rod. He, he had straight pipes and, and Studebakers were rocking back in the day. <laughs> but uh, if, if, if you get a 1950s, 1960s, early 60s kind of a car, and you can smell the gas coming out the tailpipe. It makes a bunch of power. That's the other thing. You make the most power in an engine if you overfuel it and you consume all the oxygen. You make the most, but you're wasting fuel. You make the most efficiency if you have it runs lean, which is less fuel and excess oxygen. And then you're using all the fuels, and you have oxygen left over. So mo most efficient, you run lean. Most power, you run rich. So um, the same engine will make more power in one way, but not better fuel economy. So, so it does happen. And the catalytic converter will, there's, there's oftentimes there's, um, these days they have oxygen sensors. Used to be they had an actual oxygen or air pump. And it would pump clean air into the exhaust. And when you do that, and the CO and the HCs go into the catalytic converter, the catalytic converter heats up, it recombusts the non combustible stuff, and that takes care of this and the HC. Uh, NOx is also recombined. If it's hot enough, then it, NOx comes together and the nitrogen goes back together. The oxygen goes with another piece of oxygen or with the carbon and becomes. CO2 or O2. And the catalytic converter that's actually the combustion? It's, it's, it's yeah. It's it's just like the catalytic converters in your tent. Yeah. That they say, you know, don't put it in your cool. tent. It, it's, it's, There's also the EGR, which is the sends your exhaust gas back in your intake and out. Yeah. So the EGR is the exhaust gas recirculation. And when that valve goes out, it's going to cost you money. What that's doing is it's taking the exhaust, putting it back into the intake, and reducing temperature of the combustion because instead of having so much fuel and air mixture you got fuel air and this this mostly um, inert mass so when the fuel burns it limits the temperature but it's still a mass that can expand with the and, and create a pressure gotcha. and it limits the temperature which then limits the, the how much that can form so that's really what the EGR is about. It's all about living that. And there's whatever 
unburned stuff goes in there also it's going to get freezing. So the CO and the H, but it's not all the exhaust going back to your. No, so it's, it's a little bit. Yeah. The biggest thing about that, I think, is the reducing the, having more thermal mass in there such that the amount of energy doesn't drive the temperature up to the point it's where. Basically creating an insulator inside its own fuel brakes. Kind of. It's, like it's just, it's just, it's a temperature limiting thing. So that's, that's not what we study, but that, that's, you know, you get beyond what we're doing and then you start figuring out there's sulfur in the fuel. You get sulfur dioxide, um, which you can't really deal with so well, but sulfur dioxide created acid rain. So sulfur in the fuel becomes uh, like sulfur dioxide, which then goes up and with moisture becomes sulfuric acid, and then it comes down as acid rain. And uh, now the sulfur is pulled out of the fuels. In fact, as of 2007, diesel fuel finally has uh, low enough sulfur, and the sulfur will poison the catalytic converter that does the rest of this stuff. So um, that's something that the refineries had to take care of was removing sulfur and diesel fuel just had low enough sulfur as of 2007 that you could put a catalytic converter and all that and diesel since 2007 now finally have catalytic converter but they also have to have a particle trap because you've seen the black smoke that comes out it catches the black smoke 2006 and before it was just you know a, just a tailpipe, just like a 1960s car. Cars have had catalytic converters since like mid 1970s or something like that, but it didn't get it for diesels until they could take the sulfur out of the diesel fuel. And that's recent. But sulfur's a bad one, but that's, and, and frankly, if, if you look up, uh, I think it's Fort McMurray in um, Northern Alberta, and you look up sulfur stockpile and find a picture. Maybe I should do that. Um, I might have that wrong. Yeah. So there's um, there's where the sulfur goes. Um, let's see if we can get a scale on it. Um, a semi truck is about that big with two trailers. Yeah, two trailers. And the rain rains on this, and all around it it becomes this basically sulfuric acid thing that they have to deal with. But this is what the tar sands are really sulfurous up there. And they have to refine it and they get this elemental sulfur. If you have a use for sulfur, I bet they'd sell it to you. In well, fact, they might pay you. If you realize that sulfur is used in like getting stink bombs, they could probably supply a factory for eternity with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you could supply an entire universe, probably. Get Martians and, you know, yeah. <laughs> He's got a weaponizer, then we'll be down. Yeah. Oh, yeah, weaponizer will be gone in a flash. Um, <laughs> This, this happens, yeah, that happens to be especially sulfurous stuff. One of the things about Saudi Arabian crude, they call it sweet crude and not sweet. Saudi crude is really low sulfur. And that's what they, when they call things sweet crude, they, they mean they don't have to do this. But sweet, we don't have to run it through the desulfur. It's cheaper to refine. Cheaper to refine. Uh, although we have, they, they still do have to pull some out, but not as much as these guys do. This is the... Uh, the tar sands thing that goes on up there. Um, so anyway, that's that's uh, acid rain that didn't happen, by the way. If you think about it, you know, didn't instead of getting spread all over. Um, and what does acid rain do? Why would we care about acid rain? Doesn't it erode the environment and kill a bunch of crap? It's the way it ever so much. Yeah, and and uh, the first. I think that what I heard, they kind of sort of first discovered that there were some beautifully pristine, clear lakes in Sweden that was getting all like the German and the Polish and the Russian uh, plumes of 
stuff were coming up there. The rivers were sparkling clean. In fact, they were like really clean. They were you could see things really well because everything was dead. No, not you know the algae didn't grow, the fish didn't grow. There's no fish poop. There was no algae. There was no aquatic plants. They concentrated in uh, these beautifully pristine lakes that were lifeless. And there was a bit of that going on out of the northeast. When they discovered it there, then they looked at it and found that Canada was having some of that just up from, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, up in their, their small lake. There was all these power plants from there that things would drift up into Canada and come down with acid rain, and they had beautifully pristine lakes with no fish in them, too. The pH balance was too. pH balance was all off, <laughs> but it makes it nice, clear water. Okay, so that's what goes on. The other stuff that happens when this happens, we're just when we'll be looking at this. We'll be doing a worksheet on this uh, on a lab late in the quarter. But uh, the other thing that happens, uh, the CO two thing. Uh, if you do the numbers on how much carbon there is in a gallon of gas which is, you know, you can do the density of it, and you know that uh, based on if you've got octane, then some proportion of the, the weight of it is carbon weight, and it, just whatever carbon gets turned into CO2, every um, 12 ounces of carbon turns into 44 ounces of CO2 because, or 12 grams or 12 kilograms or whatever, 12 carbon becomes, O2 is a 32, and you put carbon on it, it becomes 44, so it gets magnified. Um, every gallon of gasoline generates about 20 pounds of CO2, CO2 gas. And we did a number for, for you know, how, how much CO2, you know, what was it, 10 pounds or 10 kilograms was like 5 by 5, that much of a room. Um, yeah, there we go. Four gallons would fill up your standard bedroom. Um, I think it was 10 kilograms when we did the numbers, but um, if you think about the um, the unit of measure for carbon dioxide um, generation is a metric ton. So if you have a um, renewable energy credit, which is is how they monetize, how they compare how much CO2 is generated. So like, you know, um, they're getting to the point where they might get cap and trade on they're trying to limit the pollution. And if, anyway, the renewable energy credits is how they trade back and forth for efficient and non-efficient producers. To give it a money, if there hasn't been part of the money uh, value of fuel. So it, nobody cares about it. If you can't put money to it, then you can't account for it. And nobody, it's not part of our money system like buying a fuel is. But basically think about it. To get 1,000 kilograms, 10, or yeah, 1,000 kilograms of 10, it's like 100 gallons of gasoline. And that would be, if, I, if my numbers are right here, um, so it's like 100 gallons would be like 2,000 miles of driving. So an average car, if that's, I'm winging this here, but if that's, if you got a car that's getting 20 miles a gallon or 25 miles a gallon, maybe, I don't know. Um, so maybe 2,500 miles, that's a typical car is probably putting out six tons of carbon dioxide a year if you're driving. 12,000 miles, or something like that. In the 411 class, we do the numbers on like a coal-fired power plant. So you get a 500 megawatt power plant, which is sort of industrial scale, not, not super big, sort of typical. 
um, you have to deliver a, a train of coal to it. That would be 100 cars at, um, like, three times a week. And just unloading 100 cars and putting it somewhere and, and you have to have a stockpile and all that. Just dealing with that is a big, big issue, let alone burning it. But in the process of burning it, each car is 100 tons. And there's 100 cars. So I don't know, 100 times 100 times 1,000, however many kilograms, 100, you know, 2,000, 100 kilograms, 2,000. And then you take for every 12, um, 12 units, 12 tons of coal, which is basically all carbon, close to that, you're generating 44 tons of CO2. You can imagine, you know, the scale of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, that's what the global warming thing is about. The, the Earth also consumes it. All the trees, all the plants, all the grass is taking carbon dioxide from the air and it uses the water, the ground to get water, it uses the ground to get nutrients. Um, but basically all of the plant and the, the roots below that are about as big as the plant itself, they're carbon structures and they're all built from carbon out of the air. The plant, the photosynthesis grabs the carbon. So there's a balance point. You can burn a bunch, you can burn, you know, whole forests down, that, that re releases carbon too. But if the forest regrows, it's going to capture that. Uh, one of the problems is uh, green fuels, like, you know, the biodiesel. I'm a big fan of biodiesel. But um, in uh, places like Indonesia, they're generating a bunch of biodiesel from palm oil. And they're tearing down. They're, they're ripping out and burning up um, forests in tropical forests to plant palm oil that that in the process of burning down the forest, they're probably releasing as much carbon as they're going to collect with the green fuel thinking for about, some years to come. On the same line, what do you think about just the same, you mentioned about how much is the palm oil. What about recycling? Are you, do you like, do you favor of it? Recycling in general? Or? In general. About oh, how yeah. much heat it releases and all that. Is it still new? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. In fact, in the back of the room, we have a little, by the garbage can, there's this thing up there, and it shows how much energy you save for number one, number two, plastic, uh, maybe aluminum, okay. steel cans. Um, it'll save overall uh, anywhere between um, 50 to 75 percent of the energy of, of the new product. Do you have to pay here to recycle? Uh, no. It's free to collect yeah. recycle here. Yeah. So, um, okay. yeah, here not in Chelan. You pay in Chelan. I have to pay. Is it, is it collected? It's collected, but no. I have to pay. Yeah. That's that's uh, so here. Uh, well, you probably have to pay if you get it collected. Correct. I I happen to live in Roslyn. They don't require everybody to sign up for collection. But it's free if they collect. Uh, no, I don't know that for sure. Okay. But the, re the the transfer station, and there's one down here, kind of at the end of Main Street. Uh, that you can just throw stuff there. But so the energy is definitely uh, the net energy on it okay. is is the same. Um, so that's where that's what all that's about. So this this number here is. You know, it's not just about gasoline. It does turn out that when you do the numbers, the amount of energy you get per ton of CO2 form is about half as much for um, natural gas as it is for Earth. The amount of energy you get per ton of CO2 exhaust is about, uh, you get twice as much energy for natural gas as you do for burning coal. And I, I'm not entirely sure where gasoline fits in there. It's in between. Those are like the two extremes. The coal really, um, you know, it's, it's, we you don't think of use a bunch of coal, but there's coal trains that run, run through here every day. 
I mean, I've chased them down down the valley. They're, they're returning. They, they go. I think they go up uh, the Columbia River, dump their coal in um, Centralia. There's a plant plant there that is by 2020. It has it's it's they're converting it to natural gas, so it won't be by 2020. But right now, there's a coal train that goes up. Jumps the coal and then it comes back around and comes through Ellensburg almost every day. Um, so there's interrelated issues for all this. Again, this this is like you know the, the big picture stuff. Um, and this this also sort of tracks something called the, the triple bottom line for companies. There's usually three things. Um, Yeah. Energy security is a political issue. What if you, if we were totally dependent on Russia for our fuel? Would that be a good thing? If you read the newspapers, would that be a really good thing? Europe's like 60 or 70 percent dependent on Russia. Do you think that's going to affect their politics? So is that a political issue, energy security? Yeah, you bet. What's that mean? Can you do, um, are you self-sufficient with your energy? So France, 80% uh, of their electricity is nuclear. Uh, Germany is farther north than we are, but they have more solar panels installed than the whole United States. And they're about the size of, I don't know what, you know, the size of some state like Pennsylvania or something. Um, so... And, you know, this isn't true anymore. Um, well, maybe it is. We import petroleum. We're, this is getting close to zero in the next couple of years because of the fracking boom and all that and the, the natural gas. The, 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 we haven't found as much fuel, as much petroleum as we found natural gas by doing the fracking. I mean, we're, we are finding uh, you know, petroleum stuff. But the natural gas is, has also... We have a bunch of coal. We still have a bunch of coal. That's bad karma. Uh, but the natural gas is, uh, they have, they, they fracked it faster than they have a use for it. And right now it's sort of a glut on the market. So there's a lot of things that are shifting, like the power plant in Centralia is going to go to natural gas as soon as they can get a pipeline to it. So uh, we are becoming more energy secure right now, 10 years from now, who knows? That we were 60% uh, in 2004. We were 60% dependent on foreign sources of energy. Uh, when I was just after I got my license to drive, it was 1970 something, 71, and I got my license to drive, and I had this Jeep that smelled like gasoline when you drove it, and. Uh, Gasoline was 35 cents a gallon, and oh god, three dollars and fifty cents to fill up a 10 gallon tank was incredible. That was just, it was hard to come up with that, all that money. Um, and then in 1974, there was an, the Arab oil embargo. The OPEC was formed, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, was actually formed uh, by Venezuela. Uh, and Saudi Arabia and 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 uh, anyway, there's a bunch of company uh, countries, and they basically said at that point we we were dictating this is how much we will pay for your your gas, and they said no, this is how much you're going to pay, and it was basically the, the because we suddenly became we were the Saudi Arabia of oil in World War II. Um, we, we exported to the world. Saudi Arabia hadn't come online yet. And I, I keep saying Saudi Arabia, you know, Middle East, but it's, it's mostly about Saudi Arabia, which has the largest reserves. I mean, Kuwait has them, Iran has them, Iraq has them. The, the original name for uh, British Petroleum was the Anglo-Iranian Petroleum Company. Uh, I, I like the history of stuff. And how we get where we are, and so I've been reading about it. Anyway, um, so there's, we went from uh, 1965 being 100, 
being a net exporter to by uh, 2004, we were importing 60%. In 1974, uh, there was, the Israelis went off and, and took the Sinai from Egypt and the Arabs said, BS. And so we were supporting Israel and so how, does politics ever get involved in this? Because we're supporting Israel, the Arabs said, we aren't selling to you. And we aren't selling to anyone who sells to you. And we were 5% dependent and we had um, gas lines. If you wanted gasoline, um, you could only go on a day that, if, and it was an odd day of the week. You could only go if your license plate ended in an odd number. If it was an even day of the week, you could only go on even days. Um, and when you did, everybody was all panicky around it. So they would line up at 7 in the morning before the gas station opened. And there would be a line of like 40, 50 cars waiting for the gas station to open. And the gas station would say, I got this much gas today. And he'd walk down at my gas station when he got to, you know, the 37th car, how much gas he had to put it, say, black car. And, uh, and that's, you had to make time to get your gasoline. That was when we were 5% uh, dependent. And that's, you know, that imbalance, suddenly that 5% went away. And now, you know, well, I need it more than you do. No, and people were fighting. People were, you know, the, there's people who would have vans and they drill a hole in the floor of their van. And at night they'd go park, you know, nonchalantly over the, the hole in the ground for the tank, for the fuel tank. Because they didn't have, they just had lids on them. They'd pull up the lid, unscrew the lid, and, and go down and siphon some gas out of the gas station tanks and stuff like that. Um, anyway, energy security. You don't think of Nigeria and Mexico. Mexico also has big reserves. Um, is that state? Is that state? It's, mm -hmm. it's state still, Pretty right? Pretty much. Okay. And um, Canada is also an exporter. Net exporter. Is that popular? But if, you, if you think about some of the Venezuela and Nigeria that aren't particularly stable politically, even now. So, you know, so energy security, that's a political issue. Climate change, environmental issue, the greenhouse gas thing. Um, what if we could run an electric car that used electricity that wasn't generated with this fuel, or it's just more efficient all around, either way. Um, now, there's ways you can do that wrong. You know, do a coal-fired power plant and then have an inefficient electric car. Um, but... Um, that's environmental issue, and then uh, economic issues. We consume, I'm sure, most of, uh, probably at least half of the oil that we ever have. Uh, there was this concern about peak oil because it looked like we were getting to the point where we're coming over the top of how fast we can get out of the ground. Not that it isn't there, but you know, the, the oil well that blew out in the Gulf of Mexico was first you went through a couple thousand feet of water and then you drilled a 5,000 foot hole. And it, you can't just like, and then take 10 more holes around there and it's, it takes time to do that. And that's where we're finding oil now is places like that. You go offshore, deep water, and then you have to drill deep underneath and it becomes more expensive to get it. So if the price goes up. And really what's gonna, the way, what I see happening is at some point, We'll get to the point where the easy oil is all gone. The fracking things put it off another couple of years. But uh, it'll come a point where it becomes more and more expensive. And when that becomes more expensive and renewables become less expensive. Right now, renewables are more expensive generally than, than standard energy sources. And it's all about price. And right, the, the prices were getting to the point where renewables were coming in in a big way. And now, the price is keeling over and the market for the renewables is kind of tanking. But, uh, yeah. Technology advances is basically the whole reason why we keep shifting, right? Like they, they keep estimating it and then some technology comes out that makes it easier again and we keep shifting that graph to the right. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really what they call, rec there's reserves and there's recover recoverable reserves and there's economic reserves. So there's stuff you can get that you can't afford to sell. And there's stuff that you can afford to sell. And as technology gets better, some of the recover recoverable reserves become economic reserves that you can make money doing. Oil sands, is the tar sands is a good example of that. 
uh, the price of oil has to be up 90 to 100 or 120 bucks a, a gallon or a, a barrel for that to pan out. And now the price is down to the point where they're all losing money up there. So they're shut down. That's good for the environment, but it's just waiting for the price to go up again. So, and you know, that's not just about oil. That's, um, I've seen this in my lifetime for coffee and chocolate and sugar. It's like there was a shortage of chocolate. We couldn't get chocolate, so the price went up. And then suddenly there's all this chocolate. Well, why is that? Well, because production more expensive producers could come in, and now there's enough. So it's like corn when they use corn for fuel. Now, and then the price started going way off. Or, and then it becomes not economic to make it. Right. And then they so. use, for corn, use corn. Do you have another class right now? Or? Yes. Okay. We're going to come see you today. What's the time for you to come see you?